So now in our question answer session, I've got a large list of questions here, but uh, some of the other, I think I will have to pick up only a few because we have a very short time for us. Dr. Fuster, you tried uh, not to talk about the genetics, but people have been asking the questions about genetics to you. And uh, not only that, next year the topic will be on genetics, but we probably might like to give them a teaser as to what do you think about genetics, specifically when we say that it is a disease of uh, lifestyle abnormality and behavioral abnormality. But uh, then does genetic really have to play number one and number two, that uh, do these uh, environmental changes, quite like smoking, oxidative effects, the diet and lack of exercise, do they also influence the genetics or so-called the epigenetic uh, phenomenon? So uh, I think it's a loaded question, Dr. Fuster. Probably people want to hear from you about genetics also this year itself. And basically, uh, in this rating, uh, what we found is the, the highest uh, incidence of mutations actually were related to coronary artery disease survivorship or mortality. And the question is how this compared with the conventional risk factors. And this is the story that is important. First, genetics have very little to do with what we usually talk about family history. Family history of coronary artery disease can be related the father was a smoker and then you develop coronary disease and you say it's genetic and it's not. So we have to be very careful that genetics should not be ascribed to just family history. That's the first point. Second, of patients with coronary artery disease, about 50%, there is no question, have a genetic background of the genes that we mentioned to you. But what is fascinating is when you put environment versus genetics, the environment is the, is the winner. And that is, you can have a high genetic score, as I mentioned, but if at the same time you are a smoker, or you have, for example, you are obese, that particular environmental factor probably plays a more important role than the genes. So summarizing, genetics are very important, but the environment appears to be more important. And that is, the question is what the environment means. There is a genetic factor on the environment, which is the question that you mentioned. Yes, there are epigenetics. And that is the environment that we are, and particularly during fetal life and related to the, uh, um, you know, the pregnancy, that environment is very, very important. Is the mother is actually, is, or the future mother is a smoker, or the future mother is obese, and so forth the uh, children have a predisposition for coronary artery disease once they get into the smoking environment or they get, it's very fascinating. So in summary, what I can say is a huge amount of information. First, that family history doesn't mean genetics. Second, genetics are probably important in about 50% of people who develop coronary artery disease, but environment appears to be more important than genetics. And finally, part of the environmental aspects that play a role have a genetic epigenetic background that was acquired during pregnancy or during other exposures that I can say. This is a summary of a huge topic that uh, certainly if you invite me next year, I can concentrate on this. Thank you, Dr. Fuster. There is another question for you, and uh, that is from Paul Carreon. And uh, uh, he first of all congratulates you on uh, the, your new hypothesis of uh, Alzheimer's and other senile dementias being due to the cerebrovascular disease and not due to the neuronal degeneration, or at least uh, predominantly due to the vascular phenomenon. Uh, he's asking, if it is a vascular phenomenon, then why is it that the coronary artery disease is more common as compared to dementia? Well, first of all, uh, we have to be very careful here uh, <laughs> to put together now coronary artery disease and Alzheimer's is an incredible uh, breaching, which uh, I, I am I'm very careful. And there is a gap. But the things that we are saying is the following. Alzheimer's 100 years ago said my disease is a pathology, is a vascular disease. And we are not entirely sure if he was talking about 
a disease that relates to the risk factors that I mentioned, or whether it's a disease that related to a thrombotic phenomena by beta amyloid that I mentioned. And this is something that we are investigating. Now, to go into coronary artery disease, and what, is the inf what is the relationship between coronary artery disease and Alzheimer's? We can only say that the risk factors that affect cardiovascular disease are affecting the microvasculature of the brain. And from then on, we have then to move to Alzheimer's, which is a very complex disease, which the way I see it today, and is all hypothetical, probably 50% or 75% has to do with a neuronal problem that is, has been investigated over the 100 years and with no thera therapies yet. And about 25% may be related to a vascular component. And the vascular component are the risk factors that affect coronary disease or maybe a thrombotic phenomena due to beta amyloid. This is where we are in the study that we undertook in 1,000 people, about 500 with original cognitive dysfunction, about 500 with original cardiovascular disease, coronary disease, and will tell the answer to the question presented to me, at least an opening door to the answer in the next three years. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Akenbach, uh, the question from Dr. Olavle Olatunji, uh, the, he has a two-part question here. The first one is that you said that there is the ECG uh, exercise electrocardiogram is no longer necessary, but he says that our insurance companies still force us to do them, though I think they are not very useful and it has only 50% of sensitivity. So how do you reconcile that fact? Well, this is an excellent question. Exercise EKG is used a lot. Um, in Europe, it is used extensively. The fact is that the data simply shows that the accuracy is not as good. So if you have another testing method available, <coughs> the angiography, if the patient is suited, or stress testing based on an imaging test, stress echo, SPECT, stress MR, those should be preferred over exercise testing. Nevertheless, exercise testing is not completely useless. Exercise testing modifies the pretest likelihood substantially. A normal exercise test and a pathological exercise test should be taken into account when you make your assessment of pretest likelihood of the patient. It is a balance that was you know, tried to be achieved in these guidelines, knowing that not everybody can, and in not in every patient we can perform an imaging stress test in most parts of the world, that's simply not possible. So stress EKG remains in the guidelines, not as the class one, but still recommended to modify your pretest likelihood. You have to know about the limitations. You have to know that it needs to be performed well in order to be used um, full at all. It remains in the guidelines, but we just have to accommodate for the fact that the imaging-based stress tests are simply more accurate. The, his second question is, uh, what about the coronary calcification in an asymptomatic person? Yes, I mean, this is another excellent question because it opens up a new area, and that's the risk stratification of asymptomatic individuals. I mean, this is about prevention. This is about the question whether patients should be on risk-modifying therapy or not. This is not so much about diagnosing symptomatic coronary artery disease. We know that coronary calcification is associated with the future risk of cardiovascular events, but it's not associated very closely with ischemia associated with coronary artery stenosis. So in the setting of working patients up for coronary artery disease that causes symptoms that potentially needs to go to revascularization, the calcium test is not extremely useful. You could argue that if there's absolutely no calcium, then it's less um, likely that patients have coronary stenosis, but particularly in young individuals with recent onset chest pain, you can have stenosis even without calcium. So this is why the calcium score does not play a very prominent role in the guidelines for coronary artery disease. Uh, the, uh, another question is from Rosemary Carreras for you, uh, Stefan. Uh, uh, she says that uh, you have, uh, uh, as you presented in your uh, table, that the PET and CTA have these similar sensitivity and specificity for all practical matters, the same diagnostic accuracy. So do they have any differential role that uh, our pre preferred role uh, 
uh, in the patients with chronic stable coronary disease? Uh, yes, I mean, we have to realize that PET and um, CT angiography look at different things. PET looks at perfusion. Um, so it's an ischemia test and it's also very useful for viability. So if you ask me, probably the more valuable test, particularly when a workup for ischemia is certainly the PET scan. However, at least in the environment where I work, you cannot perform PET scanning in a large number of patients. It's simply too elaborate, too expensive, and uh, absolutely impossible to use this as the, as the basis for our stress testing. So these two tests are looking at different things. There are also different difficulties associated with performing them, and not one can replace the other. But in all environments that I know, using PET as the first-line test would probably usually not be possible. Thank you. And uh, from uh, same person, the question for uh, uh, Dr. Inzuki. Uh, uh, what is your HbA1c goal in patients with coronary artery disease slash myocardial infarction vis-a-vis -vis heart failure? Um, thank you for that question. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I think that the uh, discussion about H HbA1c target uh, needs to incorporate the treatment of the patient in terms of whether the uh, strategy that's being utilized uh, can induce hypoglycemia. So that if you're using two drugs, for instance, metformin and let's say a GLP-1 or an SGLT-2, and you can get the hemoglobin A1C down to 6.8% without any risk of hypoglycemia. It's when you use insulin or perhaps sulfonylureas where you have to be a little bit more judicious in terms of protecting the patient from hypoglycemia, and therefore a more moderated uh, hemoglobin A1C target may be advisable in high-risk patients to avoid potential uh, induction of cardiac ischemia arrhythmias from hypoglycemia. And therefore, a, a hemoglobin A1C target in the mid-7% range may be uh, reasonable. It's important to note that at least in the GL in the SGLT2 inhibitor trials, specifically Emperig outcome, we looked at this specific notion as to whether hemoglobin A1C uh, was at all important in the impact of epigliflozin on the cardiovascular outcomes, MACE, cardiovascular mortality, heart failure, hospitalization, and the answer was no. So even those patients that did not experience any significant reduction in their hemoglobin A1C, the drug still appeared to be efficacious from the cardiovascular standpoint. Thank you. The uh, next question is, uh, uh, why are we stuck with the metformin as the uh, starting agent? Why not start with the SGLT2 or GLP1? Uh, it's a great question. It's a, it's a controversial question. I think endocrinologists are uh, still in a love affair with metformin. It is uh, uh, an old drug that's been out uh, since uh, 1995 in the U.S., certainly longer in Europe and South America and Canada. Um, it is uh, uh, very inexpensive, $4 per month uh, in most parts of the U.S. It, has, it may have some cardiovascular uh, benefits. Remember, those trials were done in the 1980s and 1990s, suggesting a cardiovascular advantage to metformin over other drugs such as sulfonylureas. Um, unfortunately, we'll never retest metformin in a large CV outcome trial. So the, the uh, evidence base is much larger with uh, SGLT2s and, and GLP1s. Um, I think it's more of an academic question than a practical question. Uh, metformin has very few side effects at a long term. Uh, if you can get beyond the first week or two with a little bit of loose stools, it's very well tolerated. And many patients will require two medications to achieve their hemoglobin A1C target. And if you read the ADA EASD guidelines closely, uh, it says that irrespective of the A1C, you should add one of these drugs anyway. So that essentially implies that all patients with CVD should be on combination uh, therapy. So I think it, it's, it's, it's become more of a semantical uh, discussion than it is a practical discussion. Uh, some groups are recommending initial therapy with metformin uh, and an SGLT2 inhibitor. But uh, suffice to say that it's hard to argue with the ESC guidelines, uh, which say that uh, metformin does not deserve its, its place on the throne of diabetes management. And maybe uh, we can start with an SGLT2 or GLP-1. But the cost implications should also be considered because these medications are 100 times more expensive than metformin. Great. 
and uh, then uh, there are a couple of questions uh, for me. Um, the first question is uh, that uh, uh, what is the role of uh, tocilizumab? And uh, the answer to that is that uh, the, uh, the study, uh, the, the phase three study, which was just uh, recently reported by Gilead, the, uh, the drug company maker. Uh, um, uh, so they, they presented that there was not much of a difference except the fact that there was uh, a, 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 an earlier discharge from the, from the hospital. And uh, the study that came from Italy that demonstrated that the people who died uh, on tocilizumab, although that was not a randomized study, that was significantly lower as compared to the people who were not treated with the, with the uh, cytokine inhibitor. So uh, uh, I would not be able to say that there is a, a major understanding in terms of where exactly should it be started and how should it be given. But uh, uh, so far, the data are not uh, uh, unequivocally conclusive. And the second question is, what about the changes at six months? Do we need to follow everybody until six months? And uh, would we need to do the uh, magnetic resonance imaging in all our patients? So the uh, answer to that is yes, that uh, the uh, abnormalities by MR has been shown uh, up to six months. And it has been demonstrated that there is a likelihood of uh, edema or a likelihood of increase in the extracellular fraction, even way after the antigen is gone and whether or not the antibody is present in these people. Uh, but uh, we need to have that uh, uh, um, uh, balanced uh, view here because we do not know what happens uh, in uh, all the viral infections. We do know that the viruses affect, there are multiple cardiotropic viruses that they do affect the heart, but we have no idea as to what happens. Do they also cause that much of uh, uh, edema? Do they really lead to so much of a permanent uh, abnormality in these cases? So long-term follow-up would be needed. Essentially, if there is an edema which is caused by them, we need the, the lymphatics and all to mature enough so as to remove the, um, the uh, edematous uh, collections from the interstitial spaces. So I think the best thing would be to follow them up rather than getting too excited about it. We do know that in the uh, athletic or the professional athletic areas, there has been a significant concern about this, but, uh, uh, but the most important thing would be the follow-up data here and as to how it evolves, how it disappears, and also to be able to compare them with the, uh, the patients who have influenza or other uh, viral infections, where, whether they also lead to something similar and uh, whether this is just a simple uh, consequence or is it, does it have a pathogenetic role for future would need to be established before we can say anything with certainty. So I think there is one more question that just came for Dr. Inzuki that should we be giving the SGLT2 agents prior to or after an imaging or an interventional procedure that requires contrast? Uh, that's a great question. I don't think we have a, uh, any information on that. A study uh, would need to be done. The way the um, SGLT2 inhibitors presumably work, although there has been some controversy recently about this, is similar to uh, the way a RAS blocker works in terms of reducing uh, glomerular pressure. Now, uh, the RAS blockers uh, work uh, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, efferent arteriole, whereas the uh, SGLT2 inhibitors presumably uh, work uh, in the afferent arteriole. Uh, but the net effect of both of these agents is to reduce intraglomerular pressure. Um, we've looked at whether cardiotoxic medications such as uh, NSAIDs, um, combined use with RAS blockades, various diuretics uh, can accentuate the potential for these drugs to lead to acute kidney injury, and we don't find anything. So uh, if anything, AKI is reduced surprisingly uh, in patients uh, who are given these medications. I was very concerned when we set up DAP-HF that because the vast majority of these HEFREF patients were on loop diuretics, that we'd see a lot of uh, volume contraction, adverse events, lots of AKI. That did not pan out. If anything, AKI events, even in, 
in that HEFREF population were less common in those taking SGLT2 inhibitors. So there may be a preventative effect of the uh, SGLT2 inhibitors uh, in the setting of some potential injury to the, uh, to the kidney, um, but uh, I don't have any data on uh, whether contrast-induced uh, nephropathy may be mitigated or accentuated. Thank you. There's a question came for Dr. Uh, Ichipuria. Uh, 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 what, is the, what are the strategic uh, uh, decisions of the American College of Cardiology for uh, the growth of the FITs and uh, young career or the early career uh, faculty members? So there is anything new that is coming and how exactly should they, should they try and avail it? Well, I mean, there's a early career section as well as a fellows and training section that they can join. There's also a lot of leadership programs. There's a leadership cohort. Uh, there's multiple leadership cohorts, actually. Uh, one that is in for people that want to be uh, researchers, one that is just a leadership cohort. And we're actually in the fourth cycle of that leadership cohort. Uh, and each year they have anywhere from 20 to 25 members of that leadership cohort that help them go through a training program. So there's been a lot of work done in the pipeline uh, for early careers and fellows in training. So I think there's a lot of opportunities. They need to go on the acc.org website and take a look, uh, but lots and lots of opportunities for, for, those, for those folks. And uh, one question which you may not like to answer or uh, you may like to answer it very diplomatically, Dipti. Uh, uh, the question asked is, uh, how, do we, how do we make AHA and ACC into a one combined uh, organization? Well, I mean, I think that the, the, the goal, the mission, vision, and the goals of the two different organizations are somewhat disparate a little bit. I think that there are lots of common grounds as we have found when we do the guidelines, for example, that's why the ACCHA combined guidelines. Uh, I think that those are things that need to have uh, further conversations. I think that the leaderships need to get together and continue to have those conversations and continue to find the common ground so that we may find that maybe we're more similar than we are uh, different. So I think those are good goals to have in the future. I'm not sure that's a, something that's going to happen in the next year during my presidency, but I'd certainly think that that could be something we can work towards. <laughs> Very well answered. And that is why you truly deserve to be the president. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, uh, uh, the next question is uh, to Dr. Fuster from Dr. David Harnick. And uh, it is that why people on anticoagulant and antiplatelet agents develop Alzheimer's disease? Uh, well, excuse me, why every patient die? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think I gave the answer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the life is not, doesn't depend from one particular variable. It depends yeah. of thousands and thousands. And actually, this goes back to machine learning. One of the things we are... <laughs> that artificial intelligence is going to tell us are variables that we never thought were important and are really important. So I'm not answering your question, but saying that the number of variables that play a role in any, in any, any manifestation of cardiovascular disease or mortality is much larger than what we usually think about it. And that's where machine learning is going to tell us a lot. Okay. Uh, Dr. Inzuki, uh, any trials with both GLP-1 and SGLT-2? Uh, not that I'm aware of. It's a good uh, question. It's a very expensive uh, combination, probably approaching $1,500 per month. Um, there are small uh, trials looking at efficacy uh, in terms of glucose lowering and uh, uh, effects on body weight. The body weight appears to be additive, not synergistic. Uh, the A1C effect appears to be less than additive, as is often seen when you're combining glucose-lowering medications. The real question, uh, which is the implication of the question, I think, is whether there is either an additive or a synergistic effect on cardiovascular events. There could be, right, because the, the, um, the effect of the GLP-1s appears to be mainly uh, through an anti-atherosclerotic process. At, at least that's the inference from the clinical trials. Whereas with the SGLT2 inhibitors, there's many different theories. 
um, the event curves diverge almost within one to two months re regarding heart failure hospitalization and CV death, suggesting that there may be uh, an abrupt hemodynamic benefit from using an SGLT2 inhibitor, whether that's effects on afterload and preload. I know, I know cardiologists don't like that because they point to the fact that other diuretics have not had such an effect on, on uh, clinical outcomes. Uh, but uh, there may be the opportunity for having these drugs in combination working differently on the cardiovascular system and therefore being additive or potentially even synergistic. Thank you. Uh, I apologize, I forgot to give the credits for these questions. This question was asked by Dr. Harvey Kramer and uh, the earlier question on why not start with the, with the uh, SGLT2 instead of the metformin was by Dr. Ali Ajmal. So I think uh, Dr. Um, uh, Sharma has been sending me the text messages that uh, I need to end the uh, session here. But, but if I can say one thing, there are many other questions there. We will send those questions to the individual faculty and then answers will be uh, posted uh, along with the rest of the meeting. I think that probably will be the best way. Thank so you. There are many more questions there.